that Schumacher has told the team over the radio on the slowing down lap that he is going to retire. It's now official, apparently. A press release is going out as we speak. Schumacher is retiring from Formula One. He can't stand for anyone else to win. I think Michael has no bad days. You need to do every everything perfect to beat him. He doesn't know where the line is between hard but fair or ruthless but foul. He's the strongest as a package. It's not just the driving, you know, he works very hard with the team. He's a very, very special individual and a great sportsman and a great athlete. That's what makes a world champion, and uh, I'd be disappointed if he was the other way. Michael Schumacher has retired after 15 years. In that time, he's won seven championships and become the undisputed king of Formula One. The Brazilian Grand Prix into Lagos, the last race of the 2006 season, and there's a chance Michael could make it eight titles. Michael has a mountain to climb. The Brazilian Grand Prix of 2006 is underway. He starts 10th. Then a puncture ends his title hopes. You're riding on board with one of the greats, if not the greatest racing driver in the history of Formula One. And he finishes fourth. Michael Schumacher's Formula One career is over. But how would he be remembered? Motor racing hero or villain? Hey, when Michael died today, was amazing, you know what I mean? I, I don't understand why the guy stopped. I will miss him definitely a lot. Uh, he's been terrific for, for the sport. It started more quietly, 37 years ago, in a little German village just outside Cologne. Michael Schumacher came from an unpromising racing pedigree. Dad, Rolf, was a bricklayer, and Mum, Elizabeth, worked in a cafe at the local kart track. It looked like he'd follow his dad into the brickyard, but then Rolf built Michael a go-kart for his fourth birthday. Michael took to the sport instantly, showing talent and speed and even an early skill in handling the media. It quickly became a family affair. Dad built the carts, Michael won in them. Even Michael's chubby little brother got in on the act. When I really started to do kart races, it was nice when he joined sometimes. I mean, he tried to give some help as much as, much as it was possible. It's always difficult to, to work together with your brother sometimes. It was at this time Michael spotted another young carter at the World Championships, someone whose skill Michael instantly recognised and respected, Ayrton Senna. By the mid-80s, Michael had won almost everything in karting, and his talent soon demanded a higher rung on the racing ladder. In Formula Ford and Formula Koenig, Michael won a string of victories that lifted him into Formula 3, and his first major success. A hard-fought battle with a young Mika Hakkinen at the Macau Grand Prix of 1989. At the same time, Michael Schumacher also raced sports cars for Mercedes-Benz, and his name began to appear on the Formula One radar, although not always for the right reasons. I was not sure he could make it. He was in there in a team with uh, Frensen and Wendlinger, and there was no evidence that he was quicker than him. But that didn't stop Eddie Jordan giving Michael his first Formula One drive, the Belgian Grand Prix at Spa in 1991. Although for reasons based more on commerce than talent. We needed somebody to pay for the engine bills and the tyre bills. Uh, he was about the only one who could do that. He paid, he got in the car. I'd love to claim it was all to do with talent. It's not true. I needed the money but I did know he was a good quality driver, and the rest is obviously now history. It was Michael's first time in a Formula One car, and he qualified a quite incredible seventh. Unfortunately, the honeymoon was soon over. And Michael Schumacher's Grand Prix has ended on the first lap. The German is out. But it had been enough to prompt other teams' interests, and for the very next race, a young Flavio Briatore poached Michael for his Benetton team. 
And uh, off the road goes Michael Schumacher, regained it, didn't he? Martin Bramble goes through into third place. He was a difficult teammate because he was so fast, uh, quite strong in the heads, a little bit obnoxious sometimes. He had a bit of a, a shine about him every time he got out of the car. The shine was in every single case. I enjoyed working with him as a teammate, actually, but there, there were some aspects. He, he drove me off the road a couple of times, but generally we got on well. I think we achieved a lot in 92. And just a year after his first Grand Prix appearance, Michael claimed his first victory. The first win ever for Michael Schumacher, and he puts his arm out, and he is naturally elated. The 92 season saw Michael battling the young Carter who had so impressed him years before. It's and Senna. A respect grew between the two, even if Senna didn't always like Michael's style, most explosively at the 1992 French Grand Prix. But it was a lasting respect, obvious to see years later when an emotional Schumacher equaled Senna's record of 41 victories. In 1993, he finished fourth behind Prost, Senna and Hill, and 94 saw an older, if not always wiser, Michael, finishing second in the Spanish Grand Prix despite being stuck in fifth gear. His driving was spectacular. But how he went about winning wasn't always so impressive. Most famously at that year's title decider, the final race of the season in Adelaide, where Michael was battling Damon Hill for the championship. He is uh, gifted but flawed. Don't like his default where he uh, runs people off the road when he's in trouble. I always felt he was so good, he didn't need to do that. And I think it's damaged what would be the, probably the most glittering career ever in Formula One. Look, Schumacher's off, Schumacher's lost time, yeah. Hill goes by. Schumacher, the German is out of the Australian Grand Prix and Damon Hill only has to keep going to be world champion of 1994, but can he keep going as Damon Hill retires from the Australian Grand Prix and the 1994 World Championship has been won, a lot of people will say, by default, Michael Schumacher scarcely able to believe his luck. It would not be the last time Michael would be accused of cheating. But for the time being, Benetton and Schumacher were unstoppable. The next year saw nine wins, 11 podiums and another ballsy battle with Damon Hill for the title. Opportunity. Schumacher running up to the Williams. Now, is he going to have words with Damon Hill? And there's going to be a big, big discussion about this as a disgusted, angry Michael Schumacher walks back with Damon Hill, and the crowd are delighted. Despite appearances on the track, there was a deep respect between the two drivers. But 1995 was Michael's year again, and championship number two. It looked like the beginning of a lasting relationship between Michael, Flavio and Benetton, but Michael had other ideas. It was a difficult decision for me to leave Benetton, but I felt, and I still feel this, it matters to me how I achieve something, how I win the races, and I was looking for that particular challenge. This is the the best option to achieve something for the future. And a challenge is what he got. When Michael joined Ferrari, they were a struggling team. But then, Michael and Ferrari began one of the most impressive comebacks in Formula One history. But it would be hard work. He was one of the first, I think, uh, to, to really work in every area he could think of, you know, training and, and uh, pushing the team as hard as he could and spending, you know, night and day trying to improve the car. I think his application it was at a different level to anyone prior to him, and that was both in the car and outside the car. Well, I think he took uh, his involvement with the team and his work with the engineers to a new level. Uh, it's not unusual for Michael to be here at 10, 11 o'clock on a Saturday night. There were early successes. An emotional win at Ferrari's home circuit at Monza in 97, 
and a first win for Ferrari at Monaco since 1981. But there were bad times too. Work. You hit the wrong part of it, my friend. Accused of cheating again after a disqualification from the 1997 World Championships for deliberately driving into title rival Jack Villeneuve. And the following year, just missing out on the 1998 driver's title. In 1999, on the first lap of the British Grand Prix, things went from bad to worse. Oh, he's locked his brakes. It's as simple as that. It's a mistake. Look, and now he can't slow down. A simple driving mistake there from Michael Schumacher. Michael snatches a brake, look, and then snatches both of them, panics, and just stays on the pedal straight to the scene of the accident, and at, that is at, a big impact. Yeah, at a, at a very considerable speed. That year, Ferrari won their first Constructors' Championship since Michael had joined them, but it was bittersweet. Michael's crash, caused by a rear brake failure, left him with a badly broken leg and a question mark over whether the great German would be able to return to form. Michael Schumacher is retiring after 15 years in Formula One. There have been headline highs and headline lows. Moments no lower than the 1999 British Grand Prix, where a failed rear brake sent him crashing into the tyre wall at Stowe Corner. He missed the next six races and the chance of claiming his first driver's title for Ferrari. But Michael fought back. He worked harder and came back fitter, stronger and even more determined. I think he worked harder than the majority out there. And uh, when you look at some of the other drivers that are probably going to take over um, from Michael in, in winning several Grand Prix, then they, they just don't appear to make the same effort. Uh, to drive one of these cars for a Grand Prix and get out as though you've, you've, you've done nothing, I mean, barely sweating, uh, is exceptional. His level of fitness is incredible. The Ferrari bad times were about to come to an end. Schumacher leads, Hacking and Coulthard and Barrichello side by side as they go through. I think he's just 100% uh, uh, complete. The next five seasons belong to Ferrari and to Michael Schumacher. Record after record fell. Michael smashed Senna's record of 41 race wins, Prost's record of 51, then Fangio's five championships. In 2004, Michael left the rest of the grid in his wake, winning 13 out of 18 races and becoming the first driver to win five consecutive world championships, a magnificent seven in all. Very few people that I've ever come across spend as much time as he does making sure his car is as perfect as it can be. No one could touch him. Michael became so dominant, it was whispered that his unchallenged success could even be damaging the sport. They're so passionate about their Ferrari team. It's the way they are. They love their racing here. But the Ferrari fans, the Tifosi, loved every minute of it. Maranello's spiritual home of Ferrari took Schumacher, a German, to their hearts. Victory followed victory followed victory. It's on fire, Ted! The car's on fire! We haven't seen this for years! And Michael Schumacher, what's he going to do? But in the midst of all the success and celebration, there was controversy. These legends and geniuses go sometimes to the edge and sometimes over the edge. The Schumacher belief in winning at any cost brought more calls of cheat, this time at the 2002 Austrian Grand Prix. It doesn't look as though there's going to be any team orders here, and nor should we have really have believed there would be. Oh, he's getting very close to Michael Schumacher, but Rubens Barrichello comes through. He's not going to let Michael through, is he? No, they're going to... Yes, he is! I do not! Adam and Eve, what oh. is going on? It is a controversial area, we can't deny it, but it's it's part of his DNA, that's the way he is. And, um, you know, it, he can't stand for anyone else to win. I've never heard Michael Schumacher booed before. That's such a shame. Not good, not good for the sport, not good for anybody. I don't want to see that again. A case of team orders at the very end of the race resulted in embarrassment and criticism that rocked the sport to its core, damaging Schumacher and Ferrari's reputation. 
a reputation that wasn't helped by an ill-advised attempt to put things right later in the season at Indianapolis. A clumsy stage finish that left the American crowd scratching their heads and Formula One fans deeply disillusioned. Who's going to win this Grand Prix? It's a mystery. It's Michael Schumacher, 11th win of the season. Barrichello has been given the win. According to the computer, Rubens Barrichello just won the Grand Prix. Sometimes it, it's bordered on the edge, and we all know that, but you know that that's what makes a world champion, and uh, uh, I'd be disappointed if he was the other way. And there was personal tragedy too. At the 2003 San Marino Grand Prix, Schumacher raced and won, despite hearing the news of the death of his mother on the very day of the race. It was really his decision. There's nothing we could do except give him all the support we could. We would have understood whatever he wanted to do. Here he is coming onto the podium. What a pro. Through all this, the five seasons from 2000 to 2004 belonged to Schumacher, but that was all about to change. A young Spaniard and another team on a comeback charge were about to take the spring out of Michael's step. Fernando Alonso did the impossible. He out Schumacher Schumacher. Aggressive, daring, even a little arrogant, Alonso took on the old man of the sport, and he won. And no one loved it more than Renault's Flavio Briatore, who had never forgiven Schumacher for leaving his Benetton team for Ferrari nine years before. 2005 was not a good season for Ferrari and Schumacher. Rule changes hurt their car. Alonso and Renault hurt their invincible reputation. And by the middle of the season, Schumacher admitted title defeat. Michael Schumacher, he is 35 seconds behind on lap 12. He was right. Alonso won his first championship. For the first time in five years, Michael was not number one. The 2006 season didn't look like it was going to be any better for Michael. A massive smash in Australia gave the race to Alonso. A few races later, at the twisty Monaco circuit, where pole position is as good as winning the race, Schumacher did something that left his reputation in tatters. He's made a mistake somewhere in the middle sector of this lap. One second oh, he's made ago. another one at the Ras Cas Martin, straight on. Missed the turn in. Yeah, but that's going to spoil everybody else's lap too. The yellow flags are going to be out, and it's, that's going to keep him pole position. I wouldn't be at all surprised. Everybody's going to have to get out of it with the yellow flags. Alonso's on a flyer too. Here he comes. Alonso's coming up to the zone now. Will he get through the Rascas zone? He will indeed. He's got through. Alonso might just do it, James. Yeah, out of the final corner goes Fernando Alonso. He goes across the line. Is it pole? No, it's not. He misses out. Michael was again called cheat. He was thrown back down the grid and Alonso went on to win. Cheapest, dirtiest uh, thing I've ever seen in Formula One. This is the way Ferrari manage, you know. But Monaco set the tone for another Schumacher comeback. He may have only scored two wins in the first nine races in 2006, but he fought back to win five of the next seven. Classic Ferrari, classic Schumacher. Michael Schumacher wins! Michael Schumacher wins! His third win in a row in this 2006 World Championship because Michael Schumacher wins the Italian Grand Prix, but it's given him the victory that gives him the lead in the World Championship. In the middle of this run came Monza and the news that had been hanging over the whole season. I have my own view about the Ferrari situation. I think that Michael was pushed out. They'd already signed uh, Raikkonen and it was very difficult for them to get rid of Massa. It's a shame and you could construct it that he's run away from racing with Raikkonen next year as well. And I think that just takes a little away from his achievements. He's 
said, I don't want any distractions. I just want to race on Sunday and then we'll talk. And now we will talk. Sean Todd looks, doesn't know whether to laugh or cry. And just listen to the crowd. There he is. Nothing, nothing will keep us together. At the end of this year, I've decided together with the team that I'm uh, going to retire from, from racing. It has been an exceptional, really exceptional time. Ferrari has done a fantastic job for him, and he has done a fantastic job for Ferrari. You know, so I mean, that's uh, what a wonderful combination. Where would you place him in terms of the, the ranks of all-time greats? It's a very good question and very difficult to answer. Top three, but Senna still be my number one. He's uh, set the standard that, that other drivers, Formula 1 drivers, have to achieve. And uh, I think you can see some of the younger guys realising what, what needs to be done, uh, the commitment you need, um, the level that you can uh, take it to. According to the record books, Michael Schumacher is the greatest driver that's ever climbed into a Formula One car. There's no doubting his dedication, his skill, his commitment and his desire to win. There's no one like him, and maybe there never will be again. But will his single-minded dedication to win at all costs mean he'll be remembered more as Dick Dastardly than Peter Perfect? As for his legacy, only time and the pack of young, hungry drivers who want to take his records will decide how he's ultimately remembered. Stay with ITV1 for Tarrant on TV, coming next.